first of all, before we get started here, I want to just express some gratitude. Um, last week, New Year's Day, Gary and I were in Michigan, and Susan Lewis preached for us. And I would just like to say thank you from the bottom of my heart. I watched the service. Yeah. I watched from Michigan, and um, I just said to her, I just was so inspired. Um, I felt the Holy Spirit. I felt the Holy Spirit in the whole service, which was fun for me. But your words spoke to me, and I, I just want to thank you for that. Um, this past, oh gosh, I think it was August or September, we did a survey of the church, and we really wanted to know what do the people of St. Andrews want? What are they needing? And we were thinking about this new year coming up, 23. And the results of the survey were pretty clear. Most people want to know God more. Most people want to feel closer to God. Life's not easy, and most people really need it, and that's why you come to church. But there was also other things that were obvious in the survey, too, that everybody was feeling kind of pulled in different directions, and so it wasn't always easy to do the things that you want to do because of all the, the busyness and all that was going on in life, the complications of life. And if you think about it, this January or February, really, is coming up on three years since the pandemic started. And with all the horror of the pandemic, we also learned some lessons, and that was that many people felt like, oh, before the pandemic, we were too busy, we're too, our lives were too crazy. And so we got in and we started saying, I'm gonna, we're going to do things different. I'm going to reprioritize my life. People changed jobs, and people tried to do things differently. They learned from it. Yet three years later, it seems like it has sped up again, and we're beginning to feel some of the same angst that we felt before, and just basically seeing that sometimes it's, it's hard to find God. And so we came up with this theme for 2023 is finding God in an overwhelming world. And that's going to be the theme that's going to carry us through 23. And we have some initiatives, which I'll talk about later in the service. But we just, we want to be aware that sometimes it's hard to find God. That sometimes life doesn't encourage you and help you. In fact, it's hard. And so today we're going to start out with a sermon about why it's hard. Because I want you to see it's not just you. It's human beings. It's the way we are. It's the way we were created by God that sometimes makes it hard to find God. So I'm going to read to you out of a, a passage in Romans today. And this passage is very theological, kind of hard to understand. And so I'm going to break it down for you so you understand what you hear. So don't tune it out. Try to listen carefully to the passage, and then I'll try to help us all find some common understanding about why it is hard sometimes to find God. So I'm beginning in Romans 1, verses 18 through 25. God's wrath is being revealed from heaven against all the ungodly behavior and the injustices of human beings who silence the truth with injustice. This is because what is known about God should be plain to them because God made it plain to them. Ever since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, God's eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen because they are understood through the things God has made. So humans are without excuse. Although they knew God, they didn't honor God or thank him. Instead, their reasoning became pointless and their foolish hearts were darkened. While they were claiming to be wise, they made fools of themselves. They exchanged the glory of an immortal God for images that look like mortal humans, birds, animals, and reptiles. So God abandoned them to their heart's desires, which led to the moral corruption and degrading of their own bodies with each other. They traded God's truth for a lie. They worshiped and served the creation instead of the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. All right. Let's begin with the word wrath. David made a reference to wrath today, and I thought, oh, gosh, we're going to talk about wrath. It's the wrath of God, and I don't think we ever like to start a, a passage about the wrath of God, right? That's not the part I like to read about. I like to hear about God's love, but I want you to understand that what the Apostle Paul is teaching us here is that most of us have a misunderstanding what is the wrath of God. This is how we think. We do, we, we live our lives, we have an opportunity to sin, we sin, and then we wait for the wrath of God to find us. It's like, am I going to get caught or not? That's the way we think of wrath. 
But that's not really what Paul is saying here. What Paul is teaching us in this passage is that wrath works differently. The wrath of God is God allowing us to have our own way. The wrath of God is when he lets us make poor decisions. When he allows us to do the wrong thing. You see, because the punishment itself is the sin. Think about that. That's something you could think about for days. The punishment itself is the thing. We all think the punishment's coming. So I've mentioned this before. When I was a certain point in my life, I don't remember how old I was, maybe 12 or so, I was stealing quarters very regularly from my mother's purse. I don't know why she had so many quarters in there every week, but I was going through her purse and taking quarters. I don't remember what I did with them. I think I probably bought food. I have no idea, but I was doing it. So when I stole the quarters from her purse on a regular basis for a period of time, I kept waiting for the wrath of God. Like, surely she's going to find out, and I'm going to be in so much trouble, and I'm going to be punished, and I'm probably going to get grounded, and all that goes with it. But that's not how the wrath of God works. The wrath of God is the sin itself. So let me tell you what it was like when I look back at that period of time. I felt a disconnect from my mom. I didn't feel as close to her. I had something. I knew something she didn't know. And I felt shame and embarrassment. And I also had fear of getting caught because my siblings would just, boy, they'd give me a hard time if I got caught. I was uncomfortable all the time. I didn't feel close to my mom, and she was like my closest friend. And I didn't feel honest, and I felt bad about myself. And I wondered, uh, who, am I, who am I that I'm stealing all the time, but I really wanted whatever it was I wanted to buy. I was sure it was what I wanted to do, but I didn't feel good about it. Eventually, the feeling itself became a deterrent, and I stopped doing it. My mom probably knew. She's a pretty smart woman. She never said anything, but I stopped because I didn't like the way I felt. At times, I almost wanted to get caught because I just didn't feel good. That's the wrath of God. It's the sin itself. Now, sure, there are some sins we commit that have greater consequences. Had I been robbing a bank, I might have gone to jail. But I wasn't. I was stealing from my mom's purse. But the punishment, the punishment was everything I went through as a result of it. And so I think it's really important to understand that that is what God's talking about. He will let us have our own way. So, so why do we have to have our own way? Why, why do we choose to sin? Here's the deal. We have no excuse to say we don't know there is a God. That's part of what the scripture is talking about. It's called um, natural response. It's a theological word that says that we really don't have any excuse for not knowing God because we can see the handprint of God around us. That's why people say, I feel so close to God in nature. Well, that's normal because that's an obvious handprint of God. But we see the handprint of God all around us in, in the birth of our children, in the different places we see blessing. We see the handprint of God. We have no excuse for believing in a divine being. But what do we do? So I've got a list of some of the stuff that we as human beings naturally do. Paul's trying to explain to us, this is why it's hard to find God. Because our human tendencies, because how we are is a human kind. Even though we know there's a God, the first thing we do is we ignore him. We pretend he's not there. And why do we do that? We do that because we're pretty sure we know better than God. We're pretty sure that we know what we want, and we're, we're kind of nervous that God won't give us what we're sure we need. We don't always feel like God has our back, and so we ignore him, and we go for the things that are not of him. I have a, theolog uh, a favorite theologian from this past century. His name was Dallas Willard. He's no longer with us, but oh, I just loved him and the way he understood the workings of humans. And he says this, when we're subject to Satan's chosen ideas and images, he can take a holiday. Satan did not hit Eve with a stick, but with an idea. It was with an idea that God cannot be trusted and that she must act on her own to secure her well-being. Here is the basic idea behind all temptation. God is presented to our minds as depriving us of what is good, or at least what we want, 
by his command, so we think we must take matters into our own hands. So we just naturally think about ourselves and get what we need, even if it's moving away from God, because we're pretty sure we know better than God. So we ignore him. When we ignore him, that leads us to the next thing. And the next thing is that we stop honoring God. When we're ignoring him, we're not worried about honoring him. And that's such a, a sad thing because we don't understand what it is to honor God even often. Honoring God, we do with our worship. We come to worship and we thank him and we praise him and we sing and we, we examine our hearts. We take communion together. We honor him with our presence. The problem is so often... We think that's for God, and we misunderstand that honoring God is for us. We need to worship. We're so distracted, we're so busy at times ignoring God that this helps us. Worship literally helps us not ignore him. It draws us back in weekly so that we can get our minds back on him. We get misaligned all the time. We get distracted. But worship pulls us in. That was one interesting priority that changed after COVID. A good portion of the church never came back. Some are watching online, and I'm so glad that we have online for people because there's a million reasons why online is the only way that works. But I also have friends that don't watch online. They just stop worshiping because somewhere in their mind they started ignoring God. They didn't intentionally, they just stopped, and then the next step is you stop honoring him. When you stop honoring him, it leads to a third thing, which is you stop thanking him. Think about it. We are busy, we're distracted, we have so much going on. We take time to ask him, but we forget to thank him. When we see a need, we come and we're like, God, here it is, I need your help, but thanking him? This is what I've learned as I've gotten older, as I've, I've moved through a journey, a lifetime of serving God. The more I thank him, the more I see his grace. The more I'm consciously thanking him for everything, the more I see, oh my goodness, his grace is all around me at work around me, and it's in other people's lives. And they'll tell me a story, and I'll say, oh my gosh, that was God's grace. And they kind of look at me funny, like, what do you mean? No, that was just luck. And I'm like, no, that's not luck. That's God's grace. His grace abounds, but because we stop thanking him, we don't have eyes to see it anymore. And we get kind of blinded, and we get sort of looking inward only. And it makes it really hard to find God when you can't see his grace. And then the last one is, is we worship creation instead of the creator. Now think about that. We are the creation. God is the creator, yet we worship creation instead of the creator. I want to talk to you about idolatry because idolatry is always thought kind of a weird thing. It's something that the people in the Old Testament did, and it was defined idolatry as the worship of a cult image or an idol as though it were God. We don't do that. That's not something part of our culture. So whenever you hear the Old Testament talk about culture of idolatry, you're kind of like, yeah, we don't really do that. that that's not our thing. We have not erected a, a golden calf so us all to worship it. We just, that doesn't mean anything to us. But here's a different ex explanation of idolatry. Idolatry is an extreme admiration, love, and reverence for something or someone. The key word being extreme. We are a people that loves our extremes, right? We are an extreme people. We extremely love our kids, and we extremely love our, our trips, and we extremely love all of our passions and our hobbies. That's who Americans are. We are extreme. The problem there is not that there's so many things that we love. It's the extreme part. You see, sometimes the things that come to us in a blessing, sometimes it, came, it comes to us as a form of grace, we take it a bit too far. They're not bad in themselves. It's what we do with them. We can take anything to an extreme. We can take busyness and money, our children and their schedules, our jobs, our trips, our blessings, our need for control, our desire for success. The list is endless. 
we get extreme, and that is our form of idolatry. It's the extreme part. And then before you know it, we worship what has been created for us, not the creator. It's kind of hard to believe we could do that, but we do without even realizing it. This is what Paul is saying. This is the nature of human beings. This is why it can be hard to find God because we are not looking in the right places. Author Greg Laurie says, the essence of Christian life is knowing God and walking with him. It's about sticking with him when the sky is blue and also when it's filled with clouds or choked with smoke. It's about walking with the Lord through the thick and the thin and pressing on through every heartache and trial that happens to come our way. Now we know that this is going to be a challenge, and so when we came up with this finding God in an overwhelming world, we knew we need some initiatives to go with it. We needed to take some real direct steps, and some of you have already seen this when we did our stewardship campaign. But I want to go over these initiatives of what we're going to do in 2023 to help us all move in closer to God, to help us to be a church that's more open and loving, to help us be who God wants us to be. So the first initiative is we're going to launch a multifaceted discipleship pathway which provides direction and tools for people at any stage of their faith journey to fulfill their spiritual needs and intentionally grow and mature as disciples of Christ. What if you're just coming in and you're not a believer? Where do you start? Where do you begin? That's what this is. This is simply a tool to help people at every point in their journey. Let's say you've been a Christian your whole life and you just feel like your, your journey's gone, gone weak. There'll be a tool that you can look at and to think how you can jumpstart this journey of a, of, a, of a walk of faith. That will be this spring. We'll do this. The next one, we're going to facilitate prayer experiences throughout the year to help people find God through prayer and spiritual growth as well as support those in need through intercessory prayer. Do you know that one of the initiatives the youth came up with is they're going to lead one of those prayer meetings. They want to lead us. They want to teach us about prayer. Isn't that amazing? That'll be coming, I think, later this month. I mean, prayer is what we need to be strong, to help each other, and to help the community around us. Number three. We're going to host worship events for busy families where they can connect during a meal together, fun activities and praise songs. We're going to create these places for people who feel like they don't want to be separated, but they want to be together to grow in their faith. A way to worship as a family. The next one. We're going to create an anti-racism team to help make St. Andrews a more welcoming and inclusive church to all races and nationalities. We're going to never be so arrogant to think that we have it all figured out. Instead, we're going to create a team where we can all learn what we need to do so that every single person who attends here feels welcome. It's going to make us uncomfortable. But for the, for the gospel of Jesus Christ, it is worth a little discomfort. Our next one, develop a strategy plan for a 2024 launch of a community respite center. That is for people who are having early stages and moving into cognitive issues. It'll be a place where their caregivers can bring them and they can be together in community and have a, a really fulfilling time together and their caregivers can have a break. Their caregivers can have a moment of rest. This is for people in our community and within our church who are probably some of the busiest and most tired people there are, and those are caregivers. And finally, we're going to find and implement new ways to connect with people and support them through life's challenges. That's who St. Andrews has always been. That's not changing. We're going to continue to be St. Andrews who's full of grace and mercy and love, and we're just going to keep expanding that because that is who God has called us to be. Gary mentioned earlier that about the booklet when you first come in, and I like this because we did this in the fall, and we're doing it again now, and this is for you to walk out of here with it, stick it in your purse or your pocket, 
Take it in your car. Take it out of your car today and take it into your house and actually read it. People say all the time to us, I didn't know you guys did that. That's because nobody reads, okay? We all get so much email. We're so inundated with all kinds of stuff. We save every email for later to read, and we never read them. We know how it is. I'm that way. Take this home and read the classes. It's classes and small groups and opportunities. I want to pull one out in general, in, in, on Wednesday because I think this is a good example for someone who has never taken a Bible class before, who's never taken a, a Bible study, who's never been in a small group. In fact, you can t would say, I'm not really a small group person. I'm not one of those. And I know people feel that way. I know people sort of say, yeah, I'll serve, but I don't, I don't do small groups. I love this because it's going to be both online and in person. Three times a week, it's, uh, excuse me, three times a month it'll be on Zoom. One time a month it'll be in person on the first Wednesday of the month when we have our community dinner. This is for people who have never read a Bible never studied, never taken a Bible study, know nothing, totally biblically illiterate. There is no shame because probably most of us are biblically illiterate, to be honest. This is just a great opportunity to mix with other people. It's a Lenten class. It's starting early. We're not at Lenten yet, but they're going to start early. And the teacher's really nice. He's been teaching here for years. He's really nice. He won't judge you if you know nothing. Or you can be as quiet as you want on Zoom and never say a word, but you will begin to learn, and that will help you combat the not being able to find God. Because that's what classes and small groups do. They help you feel closer to God. This week I, I, I found an illustration. Um, it was by um, Jim Harnish. He's a, a pastor who used to be over at Hyde Park, so probably... A lot of you know him. He was there for many, many years. He's a friend of mine. And I, I came across this illustration he gave, and I thought I would share it because it just is so timeless. He was talking about, it was back in the 90s that he gave this illustration, and he was talking about the phenomenon of a Happy Meal, which is still true today. He was saying, Happy Meals are just kind of amazing things because every kid wants a Happy Meal. What a, an amazing marketing um, thing that they have done with Happy Meals that McDonald's has done. Because what is a Happy Meal? It's just less food in a plastic toy. That's all it is. And the plastic toy is not worth anything. Yet still, every time a kid goes to McDonald's, I want a Happy Meal. There is a stage of their lives where that's, that is the thing that is going to make them happy. And who wants to be that parent who's just going to go cheap on them and not give them what's going to make them happy? So we all give them their Happy Meals. And they're happy for a minute. And then the toy is lost, and it doesn't matter. And they come back to McDonald's, and they want another Happy Meal because that happiness is long gone, and they need another Happy Meal. He said, never has a child come to their parents and said, do you remember that day you bought me a Happy Meal? It changed my life. I really began to see what is the meaning of life and what truly makes me happy, and that is carrying me throughout my adulthood. Thank you for that Happy Meal. That's never going to happen. Because that's not how it works with an unhappy meal. And so I want to I wanna quote him on these next two parts. This is Jim Harnish. Of course, only a child would be so foolish. Only a kid would be so naive to think that contentment could be acquired through some kind of external acquisition. Only someone very young would have high enough stupid quote, uh, a high enough stupid quote to believe that lasting happiness would come by a change in external circumstances, right? The truth about human beings is that we grow up, we don't get any smarter. Our happy meals just get more expensive. But the world around us tells us that happiness is always just one happy meal away. That's why it's hard to find God. Because the only true happiness is going to be in God. And it's going to be peace and it's going to be joy. And it's the very thing that's going to help you enjoy all the other wonderful things in life. But without it, they will mean nothing. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. God, thank you for understanding us. For teaching us why we are the way we are and why it's so hard to find you sometime. Yet making a way. 
that we can make our way back to you. And you are the prodigal father who stands there waiting and runs to us and wraps your arms around us when we decide to come back, when we decide to stop ignoring you. Father, help us in this next year to be the children that are constantly returning to God, constantly understanding that you are the answer to everything. In Jesus' name, amen.